and you're excited about the latest developments or some new developments in a very old and extremely famous useful scientific experiment. The so-called mirror test. What's really remarkable about it as advertised is that um, with this simple test, you can determine that an individual of whatever species has some self-awareness. Do we have a definition of self-awareness? Right now, it's, it's almost circular that self-awareness is passing the mirror test. <laughs> Didn't uh, somebody describe it as the ability to contemplate one's self? I think that's basically what it is. This was a test that was started by George Gallup. He would argue that only chimps, orangutans, and humans past a certain age are the only ones that um, that pass this this test. Can you describe the test for those who have not been following since 1970? The test is you put up a mirror. So the first thing is that they look at the mirror and they say, there's somebody else. We once had a mirror in at our cabin in Michigan and we had this robin, this poor robin spent about two and a half hours attacking itself in the mirror. Right, because and, now that's an interesting thing about the mirror test, right? That there are a bunch of animals who see their own reflection, think it's another animal and attack it. And that's generally right, the first right. thing that non-humans do. The thought is that at first you don't realize that it's yourself. I mean, how could you? And that's a very important point. Okay, so then after a while, you realize it's not somebody else, and then you, then the, then the thought is that you start to do things to test this idea that, you know, it moves when you move, that you might be that individual. Um, okay, so then the experimenter puts a mark on the individual's face. So let's say I put a mark here and then the animal goes and does this in a way onto a mark that it could only detect by seeing it in the mirror. So how do you make sure that the animal could only detect it by seeing in the mirror? Well, first of all, you have to wait and have it without the mirror because if it can feel it, let's say it could feel it or smell the mark, then it might do this anyway. And so you have to make sure it's, that's not what's going on. And, and a few extensions of this test to non-primate animals have, have not done that control. Toddlers do it easily. It's a developmental milestone, but once they do it, they do it. John Dowling, who, who I took classes from and I worked in his lab when I was an undergraduate, really great neuroscientist and a, and a fabulous person who was talking about it, one of his children. And he said that on, on one occasion, the kid could not recognize himself in a photograph. And then next week could recognize the reversed uh, picture. Yeah. So yes, so it happens on a dime, but it happens. The reason we're talking about this is because there's been a recent report, a scientist named Alex Jordan at the Max Planck, arguing that cleaner wrasse, and they are very clever, very social, very clever fish, that clean bigger fish. One of the things that Jordan says is that if you put your hand in the tank, they'll start to clean your hand. <laughs> he tried the mirror test with cleaner wrasse. What he saw was the, the typical progression. So the first thing was they tried to attack it. Um, they thought it was somebody else. The second thing was that they would swim in what he says um, in in weird movements, using weird movements, swimming upside down. The interpretation is to check whether, okay, does that thing act as though it's me? This before it's been marked and it's just sort of getting the hang of what is this mirror thing. You have to, they, you know, they, they have to be exposed to the mirror, even the chips. Um so then they spent a lot of time in front of the mirrors, which was interesting. And then they were marked and they were marked under the chin. And after that, they went down and they scraped their chin. And the numbers are pretty impressive. So a lot of the of the fish did this. Let me make sure um, I understand. So the, they, would, they would mark the cleaner wrasse underneath their skin, I think it was, right? They injected this thing under the skin and, and what 
what the cleaner rats did was to scrape their throats to get to try and get it off. The cleaner rats were used to seeing themselves look a certain way in the mirror. Once this mark was on, would scrape themselves against the bottom of the tank. George Gallup, when I first read this, I thought he's very primate centric. He's a curmudgeon. But then I read one of his critiques. He's got some very important points that he makes. Probably the most interesting one to think about is the elephant one. And this was done by Plotnik and DeWall. Franz DeWall talks about this a lot. He says, you know, originally people tried to test the mirror test with elephants and they used a little mirror. And the elephant said, who cares? And so he got, as probably only Franz DeWall could do, he got the funds to make up big mirror, an elephant-sized mirror. And then at that point, the elephants go up to it. And what you see in the video is that the elephant sees a little mark and then paws at it with the trunk. And it looks very convincing and directed. And really, Gallup can't say anything against that, except that even those same authors have not been able to repeat it in other elephants. And even the same, it was one of four elephants that showed this. One of four. Now that doesn't, to me, that doesn't matter. One shows it, that one is self-aware. Somewhere in the vicinity of self-aware. But that same one did not show it again when tested again, or shows it inconsistently when tested again. So, yeah, you know, I just don't, it's hard to know what to make of that. There are a bunch of interesting methodological questions about some of the tests that have been done. I'm particularly interested in the stuff about gorillas and how gorillas fail the test, but maybe not because, if, it, if the test does test for self-awareness, gorillas may fail it not because they're self-aware, but because of unique aspects of gorilla behavior. So one gorilla does, would never look another gorilla directly in the face. So the, any gorilla, in theory, would fail, and gorillas do consistently fail the test. That's one hypothesis as to why yeah. the gorillas may fail it. You think about cleaner wrasse, it's clear that they didn't care about it when you put, when, the, when Jordan and his colleagues put a clear glass, and behind that glass was another cleaner wrasse. So if it wasn't themselves, they never developed this weird swimming pattern. Another of the things that I, I found really fascinating is our own visual biases as humans, because the mirror test is a visual test, but there are a lot of animals out there for whom sight is not their primary way of seeing the world. For example, dogs are terrible at the mirror test. Horowitz, who did a, a olfactory mirror test. What and, in the world and, could that be? She gave these dogs their own odor or another odor, and they t she tagged that odor with a mark. Well, so first of all, so dogs so it, spend more time with the odor of their own urine than with the odor of a urine from another dog. But they react more to their own odor when it has this mark in it. Right. So that they say, it smells like me, but there's something wrong with it. Gallup doesn't like this, and I, I take his point. I think his point is a good one. He says, if it's really a mirror thing, if they really think that they're smelling that because it, they're smelling it more because it's their own self and they are somehow weirdly scented now, why aren't they smelling themselves? Why are they smelling the stimulus? And that's a good point. If I think, you know, if I think that I stink, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to go smell something else. And the, and the dogs aren't smelling themselves. And God knows dogs smell themselves plenty. There's the question of whether or not the test actually is testing for self-awareness. Whether right, the things we're right. seeing are, in fact, self-awareness. Self-awareness comes on a continuum. So when my cat watches me walking across the room and gets out of the way so that I don't step on her, she's aware of where she is and she moves herself. So Jordan says 
Alex Jordan, this individual who, who the scientist who did the, the cleaner ass experiment, he says, moving your tail before it gets stepped on or scraping a parasite off your scales isn't the same as sitting and pondering your place in the universe. This is obviously true, but you know, to quote Darwin, it's a matter of extent, not a matter of existence. We give some degree of self-awareness to other animals, then it, you know, the human exceptionalism takes another hit, which is all good from my point of view. Self-awareness exists on a spectrum. So there's yeah, maybe yeah. the wrath is maybe a little bit toward one end of the spectrum, the, the weak end with humans being on the massively <laughs> contemplating themselves and the universe end. Right. And and then chimps are somewhere closer to, to humans, but um, but not. It's um, unlikely that a chimp will contemplate its place in the galaxy. It's unlikely that the chimp will, will contemplate itself. If you raise chimps in isolation, they don't pass the mirror test. And so it's not as though they're recognizing themselves. They're recognizing that reflection of who they are that they see in others around them. And so sociality has this has this incredible influence on whatever the, this this entity that we're going to approximate by the word self awareness is. I just have to quote um, a former faculty member at the University of Chicago, George Herbert Mead. He was a philosopher and he said this wonderful, there could not be experience of a self simply by itself. There's this trite adage that what people we get from other people is another part of ourselves. And this is suggestive that that's in fact, we get our own sense of self from our interactions with others. And and this idea that you know who you are by who you interact with is exactly what we see in our rats. One of the things I like the most about this is them doing these weird swim patterns to try and, I mean, basically here are cleaner rats doing an experiment. What the heck is going on in my world, in my environment? Oh, oh, I'm a cleaner rat. I'll do an experiment. I'll just swim weird and see if it matches me. What you're saying <laughs> is that the urge to science is broadly extant right. throughout the animal community and even if you don't have fingers to rubber your or a trunk to rub the the, the uh, spot off with there's still an instinct to do some kind of experiment to see what's going on they're sciencing the day I, um, that's, it doesn't get more optimistic than that <laughs> thank you peggy